Welcome back. This is Emily Seal with Motlow College. We're taking a look at Chapter 3, which is The Actor. Before we get started on this lecture, I'd like you to go watch those clips. I have two short clips uh, about John Lithgow and his performance of All My Sons on Broadway, and then I also have a monologue by America Ferreira, who you may remember as Ugly Betty. So if you would go watch those clips before you begin the lecture, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. But for those of you who have, let's get started. Um, many of you, when you think of actors uh, or acting, you may think of a red carpet and a very glamorous someone like Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> but there are many, many actors in the world. Um, and myself included. Uh, I love that the thing that an actor really does is wait by the phone because most of us spent a lot of time trying to get work. That's a Shakespeare play that I did there. Um, so the actor's equity is the union. Um, a, a lot of jobs have unions and uh, the actor's equity 42% earned less than 5000 um, or 5000 or less. So about half of the people are not even making a, a living wage, uh, not even close. You know, the average um, income in Smyrna is 50000 That's 5000 <laughs> That's what most people make acting every year. I have some friends who are actors who, um, you know, most of them are bivocational. But then the, the part that makes you think of the red carpet is that 5% earned 75000 or greater. Now that's a great living wage. Uh, that is, especially um, here in Tennessee, that's a hefty salary. I would love to have that kind of salary. So if you are in that top 5%, you're making good money. Um, there are equity actors who live in Nashville who make good money and live uh, on that money and they don't have another job that's all they do is act but they are five out of a hundred right there are um, 95 other actors struggling and waitering and trying to make a living wage so that averages out but um, there are only about 90 actors who are full-time employed in the Nashville area unfortunately and average pay is fourteen dollars an hour which is pretty sad when you consider a lot of them have master's degrees to do what they do so um, many are bivocational which I already kind of touched on so when we look at acting there are two main approaches for the purposes of today and of course this is a dumbing down it's a simplification but um, there is what we call external acting you may have seen this guy uh, my name is in Ningo Montoya, you killed my father, prepare to die, right? <laughs> uh, his name is actually Mandy Patinkin, and he's a very famous musical theater actor, but uh, you saw some of his sword play there, and that would be considered an external acting skill. So when Mandy Patinkin went to school, he studied um, things such as how language ought to be spoken. So we're going to focus on diction and resonance and pronunciation and articulation, those sort of skills. Um, particularly if you're a classical actor, we're going to study iambic pentameter, which you've probably heard of before. It's the cadence or the rhythm that the poetry of Shakespeare and Moliere and some other guys was meant to be spoken in, right? To be or not to be, that is the question. If I don't put those emphasis on the right syllables, then it sounds less fluid, less natural. So when you study acting, you study your voice and you also study your script. So Mandy Patinkin might go into his text and underline the words that are important and he would put more emphasis on those words. He would focus on the technicality. Okay, is um, sun supposed to rhyme with none and um, looking at those sort of technical poetry elements and playing that the alliteration the assonance so physical details so external actors may have a gesture that their character repeatedly does they may have a um, leading center which means that that's the 
body language that they consistently use. So um, someone who's proud might walk with their chest out. Someone who's very sexual might walk with their hips. So these sort of physical details and being consistent in that. Does my character have a limp? Which leg? How can I stay consistent in that the entire play? So um, those physical details are, are what are really um, emphasized for an external actor. And like I said, fencing, mime, um, dancing and singing, uh, those skills that can get you a job. You know, there's not unusual for a script to come up that needs somebody who can juggle. So, you know, you'll learn those basic skills. Internal acting um, is more a focus on the psychological side of the character. And we'll talk about him a lot today, Stanislavski, Stan the Man. He'll be kind of our central th uh, theorician today as we discuss acting. He's by far the most influential um, idea man in acting today. So what Stanislavski encourages people to do is draw on their own personal experience. So if I was to play Juliet, I might think about the first time that I fell in love, or I might think about a time that I didn't agree with my parents and that was really hard for me. And I would draw on that personal experience to then create a believable Juliet. So, um, and not only would I think about what happens to Juliet within the confines of the script, I might ask myself, what was Juliet's childhood like that she now resents her parents? Or what former level lovers has Juliet had? Is this her first love? Is this a rebound situation and that's why she's rushing into it with Romeo? Um, what about who she is happened before the timeline or after the timeline of this play, although for Juliet, uh, that was poor wording choice, nothing happens for her after the play because she dies. <laughs> Oops. Um, so the, the question that Stanislavski's acting method is always asking is, what's my motivation? Uh, why am I behaving the way that I'm behaving? So if you look down at your outfit right now, uh, there's a reason why you chose to put on the clothes that you have on. Uh, for me personally, it's comfort. Right? I'm at home today taking care of my baby and I've got spit up on my shirt and so I'm wearing a shirt with holes in it <laughs> not to show all my cards but uh, you know the motivation for putting on my clothes was to um, be decent but at the same time uh, not wear anything too nice if I were to get dressed in to speak in front of you as a class, of course I would dress for success. I would want to put on a business professional outfit. I would want to dress differently from my students and stand out so that you would pay, um, hopefully encourage respect. So uh, and people have encouragements for their behavior in everyday life and that's kind of the meat that an actor lives in and trying to figure out why do people dress the way they do? Why do they say the things they say? Uh, what's their motivation? why is my character do, doing this? Um, looking for those deep-seated psychological needs. So, oh and it's worth men mentioning that Meryl Streep is of course one of the master internal actors of our time. So, um, Dennis Diderot uh, came along after Shakespeare in the 18th century, I believe, and he really believed that um, actors shouldn't do this, what Stanislavski is saying. He came before Stanislavski, but he didn't believe that actors should just indulge their emotions. He believed that we should make it scientific, which if you know anything about 18th century philosophy, this was going around, the naturalism, the... Um, uh, you know, Napoleon sort of bureaucratic uh, assigning of things. So Diderot gave actors pictures in order to enable them to pantomime uh, emotions on stage, calculated imitation to the point that I think is almost humorous. So he believed that if we are trying to rely on our own imagination, our own inner psychology, our own um, 
emoting, it's going to be less consistent. And so he wanted that every time we went to the play, it was going to be the exact same play. And there, there is some validity in that. And Cohen talks about that in your textbook, how you ought to do in performance what you practice in rehearsal, but there's not going to be any freshness. Uh, in this case, a, uh, a monkey could perform an acting. So let's look at some of Diderot's uh, encouraging. And you can see some of these in, uh, in old films, right? So if you're in horror, you must place your hand in front of your face. And if you are sulking, you should cross your arms. I think my nephew does that when he sulks, but only when we're watching. Uh, oh, mental pain, you must grab your forehead in case your audience doesn't understand. And the point of what I'm trying to say here is that um, it's going to talk down to your audience if you always use the obvious uh, gestures or the obvious emotions. In fact, Anthony Hopkins has made a great deal of money playing what we call the opposite. So a lot of villains would scream and yell and uh, when Anthony Hopkins played Hannibal Lecter, he whispered. What's creepier about a focused and quiet villain rather than this bombastic, uh, obviously evil mwahaha? Uh, so uh, I don't agree with him, Diderot, at all. So back to Stan the Man. He is from Russia and he had brought his touring theater there, uh, the Moscow Art Theater, to America to perform in the um, 1930s and that caught on. All of these young actors in New York picked up Stanislavski's method. Now remember Stanislavski is Russian so what they're reading is actually a translation of and only bits and pieces of Stanislavski's entire method. He, he published many many papers. He was um, more, there's more to Stanislavski than what um, American method took out of it. Uh, but uh, you may be asking yourself, which one is right? Stanislavski's method or this external way of, um, you know, learning skills? And most, this is me on my graduation from my master's degree, my master's of fine arts, uh, we studied both. You know, I am certified in broadsword, I took musical theater and, um, you know, learned my arpeggios, uh, I took dialects, so those are all external skills. Um, but then I also focused on text analysis, which we'll do in this class, um, getting into the psychology of my character. So it's really not, for a while there, it was kind of Britain versus America, um, the external versus the internal method. And that's no longer the case. Now, in both America and abroad, we all learn both the skills and the psychology of a character. So. So I used that word just now, and I probably shouldn't have before I introduced it, which is the method. Um, like I said, Stanislavski is more famous in America than he was in Russia. These um, young American actors really took his ideas and created what they call the method or method acting, you may have heard. Stanislavski's quote that they really latched on to is our prime task is to create the inner life of a character, right? So you need to have this running dialogue in your head that that the audience never hears. You need to get into the emotions. You need to feel and imagine. Uh, Stanislavski had something called the magic if. So you would take somebody else's situation and sort of try to empathize with what they're going through to the point where you believe you are them right? Um, and so really getting into that inner life, into that psychology. Once again, what's my motivation? Why do I do what I do? Meryl Streep said, acting is not about being someone different. It's about finding the similarity in what is apparently different and then finding myself in there. And uh, Meryl Streep has played some pretty ugly characters, some pretty unlikable characters, um, but she didn't judge those characters. She found, okay, how could I get so bitter um, that I start acting like this, for example, in doubt, right? And, and she isn't afraid to depict that ugliness um, and really identify with some ugly people. So one of the chief characteristics of a good actor is empathy. 
that feeling of, I understand why you're behaving the way that you do. I understand that must really be painful. And getting into that character's shoes then helps you to portray them. So this is by and far the most controversial element of method acting, and that is emotion memory. So the reason I have a child smelling a rose is smell is one of the um, best ways to recall a memory. So I want you to think about maybe someone who um, you've had a relationship with in the past. Did they have a smell? Was it their natural scent? Was it a perfume that they wore, a cologne that they wore? Was it their job? Maybe they worked at a coffee house and so they always smelled like old coffee. Um, and that is likely to create a physiological response for you. Um, uh, whether it be tears, whether it be your heart flutter, whether it be um, some sort of physical reaction to that memory. And, and when we got into psychology, which is, you know, Stanislavski is about the same time as Freud and these other psychologists, um, we started to realize that our memories are so closely tied to physical uh, physiology, your body response. So for example, um, as an actor, the way that we use this is if I had a scene such as Our Town, and I did, I had to go out on stage and cry. How would I create those tears? Well, for me, I think of a very specific memory, um, and in that memory, my sister is crying. And when I see my sister cry, um, she is much less emotive than I am. And so when I see her cry, I have to cry with her. And so imagining my sister crying, thinking about the details, the tear rolling down her cheek, the um, smells, the uh, and just imagining that environment again would stir up those tears for me. So if uh, you're trying to get out a parking ticket, I hope I helped. <laughs> so the group theater, like I said, they loved emotional memory. They loved this use of psychology. They kind of got into a little bit of trouble um, for being communists, <laughs> but we'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, some really famous names that you may know, uh, Elia Kazan, he directed On the water Waterfront, he directed A Streetcar Named Desire, Stella, you know that one? Um, so some really big names from the 1930s uh, up into the 50s are coming out of the group theater. And these guys really took Stanislavski's method to an extreme. So before the group theater, there was a very melodramatic sense on stage. Remember Diderot, oh no, and you get your back of your hand to your forehead, that sort of um, physical theater, very rigid, very melodramatic. And the group theater, you know, in the midst of all of this poverty and um, world wars and all of this horrible things that are going on in the world, they start to do a more real theater where they're not putting as much separation between reality and theatricality. They're acting normal on stage and they're doing plays where they're speaking in the vernacular of the people and they're acting style is very very natural and that's what you know most directors are still looking for today someone who looks natural as they act someone who you couldn't even tell that they're acting you just think that you're in a conversation with them so when you go to see uh, the play that you're going to critique that's a fair critique depending on the genre if it's supposed to be a naturalistic everyday play a play like um, Cat on the Hot Tin Roof or uh, you know one of the American dramas are they are the people on stage didactic and memorized and do they sound forced or do they sound natural do they seem like someone that you would just want to have a conversation with in the moment so a group theater completely reimagined what theater could be in America uh, based on the Stanislavski method. And they created what's called the Actor Studio, which is the questionnaire that I asked you to do at the beginning of the class. Uh, what's your favorite smell? What's your favorite word? Um, the Actor Studio is very um, much a product of this, but like I said, they now teach both the emotive and the um, external, the internal and the external. So, 
Um, another element of a good actor, besides having these skills, is a sense of presence on stage. A sense of presence. And I put So You Think You Can Dance on there because my mom watches this show. And she calls me and she talks to me about all the people and who got eliminated. And, and she always just says, she had it. You know, this mysterious it. It's a personality, it's a presence, it's um, a sense of charisma, maybe, is how some people would say it. Um, I think that Mr. Cohen saying um, a bit of the divine is a little melodramatic, but okay, I'll take it. Uh, Who has it? When you go to see the play, is there an actor that you can't take your eyes off of? They just have so much charisma. Keanu Reeves is said to be like this in audition. He just has so much charisma that he gets cast. And it's a very controversial. Some people think he's a horrible actor. Some people think he's a great actor. Um, but always when he shows up to an audition, he has an undeniable charisma or presence or a sense of the divine. Now, I've said all of these grandiose things, but I love this Noel Coward quote. Uh, acting is just say the lines and don't trip over the furniture. <laughs> You know, at the end of the day, um, even the simplest of people can uh, be an actor because you just have to say your lines. So I know I'm speaking of it in these grandiose terms, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's just just saying your lines. (laughs) So uh, each actor sort of has their strengths, and we call someone who has all three a triple threat, especially in the musical theater world. If they can sing, dance, and act, they're what are called a triple threat. So um, someone like Hugh Jackman can do all three very well. But as we learned from Les Miserables, if the movie, if you've seen it, Russell Crowe is not that great of a singer, right? He's still a good actor. Don't know about his dance skills, but people have these sort of um, skills. I was just seeing today that Jamie Foxx released an album. So there's an example of an actor moving into singer. I mean, you may have heard him on some Kanye West albums, but now he's putting out his own album. And so he's an example of someone kind of moving within this. Um, If we look at a movie like Chicago, Uh, with Renee Zellweger. You know, she wasn't much of a dancer before she auditioned for that movie, but she really wanted the part, and so she really had to work on her dancing skills. Um, The same thing with Black Swan, with Natalie Portman. So their combined skills, and even the simplest of plays, uh, dance-wise, will still require movement. So you still have to have a grace, or an eloquence, or an ability to hold your body in a way that portrays some sort of body language, or um, inference to your audience. And this is, by the way, not in your book. He doesn't bring this up. So if you're looking for this diagram, it's not in there. Um, Even if you can't sing, you need to speak in a dulcet way, a way that sounds musical and clearly can resonate all the way to the back row so that your audience can hear you. Right? So these are kind of combined and interrelated skills, but a good musical theater actor has all three. So... Okay, so we've talked about the skills of acting. We're going to move away from that into audition process or the process of being an actor in general. And like I said at the beginning of the interview, uh, sorry, not the interview, the uh, lecture, uh, auditioning is a lot of what a amateur actor at least spends a lot of time doing. Um, if you are an actor starting out in New York, you know, you're going to ride the subway from audition spot to audition spot, and it's going to take up a lot of your time. It's, um, you know, you have to try your luck many, many times before um, you get hired, is the common story. Theater is a competitive business, so I just want to warn you about that. Um, it's kind of a backstabby business sometimes. If you succeed, it means that someone else doesn't succeed. So all of that talk in the Canada um, documentary at the beginning about ensemble, the reason they have to say that is because, and the reason that's exceptional is because more often it is a competitive business where people um they may get along, but at the end of the day, they're going to do what they can do to succeed. So, 
an audition, you often only have two minutes on stage. So you get dressed, you put on your lipstick, you curl your hair, you take a taxi all the way across town, and then you have two minutes to show them what you got. And that America Ferreira monologue is a good example of a two-minute monologue. It's pretty standard in the industry. Uh, two minutes of a monologue to show your range. Now, you may also do a contrasting monologue. So you may do a minute of a classical monologue and then a minute of a humorous monologue. Uh, you can do 15 bars of music if it's a musical audition, which is, once again, just about a couple minutes. And then sometimes for a dance callback, they'll have a routine. Um, but it, it's nice work if you can get it. So the classified ads, if you're looking for an acting gig for the first time, and um, Facebook groups like uh, Theater Nashville, ha Post Auditions, um, if you have a copy of, uh, what's that magazine? Several publications anyway, and in in kind of can direct you to acting gigs. You can get an agent. An agent should never take money from you up front. They should never ask you for $200 at the beginning. Um, it's not until you get a job that you pay them. So if someone walks up to you in the mall and says, hi, I'm a model agent and I would really like for you to pay me $500 to get you started, then that is a scam. You should punch them in the face and run away. <laughs> a true agent does not get paid till you get paid. So. And there are also what were my preferences when I was um, professional acting, which is conference auditions, such as Straw Hat or SCTC, the Southeastern Theater Conference. So you can go to Chattanooga or Atlanta and audition for a hundred theater companies at one time. And that's most often kind of at the beginning or the end of a season. Uh, audition season in Nashville is in May, so if you are wanting to um, start your career as an actor. Um, on May is the best time to kind of go to one of these regional auditions. Just to give you an idea, like I said, why do they have to go to so many auditions? Yale has 900 people auditioning and 16 slots. 900. Part of the reason that this happens with professional auditions is because um, equity requires the acting companies, I mean the theater companies, to have open call auditions. So any Joe Schmo who walks in off the street um, deserves to be heard. So that's one of the reasons that there is so many auditions in a day, as opposed to if you're, you know, applying for a job in an office. So let's assume you got the job. Congratulations. Now we're starting the rehearsal process. Um, so the director, remember, I tentatively introduced him in the first, uh, or her, in the first lecture. Um, she is your coach. She has lived with this play, and she's going to direct you into her vision. Remember I said we could do Midsummer Night's Dream with fairy dust and glitter and uh, fairy wings, or we could do it with mud and fur and um, this animal instinct. So there's different visions that a director may have for the play, and so she'll introduce you to her vision for the play, and then she'll try to get you on board and coach you into creating continuity between all the actors and designers, a common vision. The nuts and bolts of what a director is going to do is give you blocking. Um, and blocking is the stage movements. We'll talk about this more when we get to directing. So she may say, I want you to enter on page seven, as it says in the script, through the stage left, come center stage, stand next to the chair to deliver this line. This will kind of give you um, directions on where to be on, in certain areas of the stage at certain times. Stage business is um, maybe the gestures that you use in some sort of physical action, uh, physical behavior. So maybe you are all playing cards 
and so um, that would be stage business you know you're gonna throw down the card maybe you um, pick up your snack and eat some snack and she'll sort of guide you through that stage business that seems unconscious but sometimes it takes the most effort to make something look natural one of the hardest things for directors is crowded scenes just making it look natural a crowded street scene because um, that chaos can be pretty difficult to orchestrate so stage business pacing and rhythm if you go to see an amateur play um, if the play that you see is slow and it drags the actors may be not picking up on their cues quickly enough which is very common for amateurish actors so um, I might say hi how are you today pause 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 I'm fine how are you that pause between lines um, that uh, internal cueing is something that's really common for amateur actors so um, it takes a lot of practice it takes a lot of um, wit to be quick and uh, to pick up on your line right after else somebody addresses you so pacing but then sometimes um, performers get nervous and they talk too fast right talking too fast could also be a problem if you couldn't understand what they were saying because they spoke too fast that's uh, also a pacing issue so creatively some actors can be typical creative types maybe they have a really um, distinct vision maybe they don't want to look stupid so they don't want to try what the director is saying but a good actor comes in willing to try at least and um, brings something to the creative process tries um, big risks in order to uh, encourage creativity in a process for example in the movie um, oh what's the name of that movie with Johnny Depp Sleepy Hollow there it goes <laughs> with Christina Ricci you may have seen it um, in that movie Johnny Depp decided to do an impersonation of a 13 year old girl <laughs> that's what that is is an impersonation of a 13 year old girl he said in the inside the actor studio um, interview in uh, Edward Scissorhands he's doing an impersonation of his dog who is always scared if you've seen Edward Scissorhands you can see his little doe eyes are really open wide um, so those are big risks if an actor came to me and said in order to play your um, leading man in what is essentially a romance mystery I am going to act like a 13 year old girl I think I would probably encourage him to go a different direction but that's one of the great things about Johnny Depp he takes these huge risks and is willing to fail gloriously so now that you've gotten this part and you've rehearsed the part now it's time for the limelight there I am and uh, I've already showed you a picture of this play of flaming guns of the purple sage um, but you going into performance now if you are on Broadway the show could run for a week and close if it fails uh, the show could run for 50 years no lie in the West End um, mousetrap has been running for more than 50 years so you can end up doing this same play over and over and over again so what do you do if you have 72 performances of Tecumseh um, first and foremost it's professional and he talks about this in this uh, in the book here to do what you practiced is professional to do what you rehearsed and that can be one of the comforting things if you're performing for the first time is just before you get up to give your um, part or your speech is just to say okay I'm just gonna do what I practice and you go into muscle memory mode and that will help you to um, feel secure in what you're doing because nobody likes to be on stage and have uh, a completely different um, blocking or interpretation of a line thrown at you it can feel unsettling and lead to um, disruptions in the performance but at the same time you have to balance that slow and steady with not getting bored 
because if you're just phoning it in, if you're just going through the motions, you might as well be doing Diderot acting. <laughs> you're just doing these gestures without any um, vivaciousness, without any magic, then the audience is going to get bored as well. So if you're going to see a play that's been performed a lot, for example, you may be going to the Tennessee Performing Arts Center to see a performing um, touring show. If that person is on tour, then they've done that show probably uh, six days a week, at least once a day for a year, uh, five years. You know, if you're going to see Lion King, 10 years. So they may be bored with their part and that may be a legitimate criticism is that you can tell that these touring actors are just phoning it in and they're not really uh, engaged in what they're doing one good thing for a performer is the audience um, if you are an extrovert like me being in front of people being around people can inspire your performance when you hear them gasp at something scary when you hear them clap between scenes that can really encourage an actor and I want to um, encourage you to be a good audience member and to give that person that good energy uh, I studied something called the Suzuki method which is a Japanese form of um, theater training and it's a lot of talk about connecting to the other including your audience and focusing in and that sort of um, you know kung fu kind of way for lack of a better uh, term but uh, really focusing in on the other and sending them good vibes and sending them good energy it can really ground you and so I want to encourage you to um, smile if your actor has to you know do direct address and look at you specifically you know give them the positive energy back so oh we are finished um, so like I said, uh, acting has been a love of mine. I've now kind of moved more into directing because it's not an easy job. It's definitely emotionally, physically exhausting. Uh, it pays inconsistently, but there's nothing like it in the world. It's just a wonderful gig, if you can get it. Thank you so much for attending today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Um, if you haven't already purchased Joe Turner's Come and Gone, please do that and get started reading that play as we will begin um, analyzing it for the purposes of this course. Thank you for listening. <laughs>